Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's DMN download call on Hemingway and Fitzgerald, a friendship and rivalry for the ages with Professor Joseph Lutzi. I am Kimmy, and I'm the rewards event coordinator here at the Dallas Morning News. And on behalf of all of us, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. We are very happy to have you. Please remember that we will have a live Q&A towards the end of the call, and we highly encourage your questions. Joseph, you're welcome to take it from here. Thank you so much, Kimmy, and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. I'm, I'm so excited about my talk and to kind of, um, you know, uh, as we virtually all get to know each other, this is, uh, I've spoken um, for, for the, for the uh, paper in the past when we were in person. This is my first um, we'll call it virtual event, um, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of you all for uh, tuning in and listening. And I guess I'll, I'll just start by saying a few words about myself. I'm a professor of comparative literature at Bard College. I received my PhD from Yale, and before coming to Bard, I taught at the University of Pennsylvania. I've written five books. Um, three of them are academic, so it, it, th those are a little more specialized. But I also wrote two books for general readers. One, My Two Italys, which is, uh, was a New York Times editor's choice selection. And that was like the story of my family's immigration from Italy and then me going back later in life to study Italian and the kind of the collision, the happy collision of those two worlds. And I also wrote a book called In a Dark Wood, what Dante taught me about grief, healing, and the mysteries of love. And that's a sort of um, a very personal book about how Dante's Divine Comedy, this extraordinary poem that I've spent a lot of my career uh, teaching and, and, and writing about, helped me through a particularly difficult time uh, in my own personal life. So um, I invite you, you can learn you know, more about me and my work at uh, my website, which is um, www. Dot josephlutzi.com. And I will tell you about one special initiative of mine that is very much connected to my conversation today about Fitzgerald and Hemingway. Um, at the begin, towards the beginning, um, I had wanted to do this for a while, but soon after the pandemic, I created something called the Virtual Book Club, which is an international community of readers that's dedicating to exploring uh, some of the best books ever written from beloved classics to recent bestsellers. And in the, the membership, it's been an incredible experience. We're in six countries now. Our membership is growing. And you can learn more about the, the, the book club. And I'd be delighted if you were interested in would consider uh, joining. You can find out about that. There's a link to that on my website, uh, josephlutzi.com. And you can always reach out to me. I'm always happy to hear from you. Uh, there's a, a contact button on my website. So, so please do make uh, use of that if you, if you like. Um, the subject of our conversation today is one that's very much in the news, isn't it? Because Hemingway's all over the place now. You know, he's got his own PBS uh, documentary. He's made it, right? Not only did he win the Nobel Prize, um, but he also has a Ken Burns documentary. That's the double whammy. And the, you know, the, the interesting thing um, about Hemingway as this iconic American writer. It reminds me a little bit, you know, I told you a little bit about my background, how it, in some ways I'm it's sort of an unlikely candidate to be speaking about these icons of American literature because I actually grew up in a house um, with, with no books in it. You know, my parents were immigrants from Italy and they very, you know, very brilliant and hardworking people. When I was growing up, they were incredibly supportive of everything, but they just didn't have an education in the traditional sense, they had like a third grade education. So whenever I was reading a book, my mom would come up to me and sort of like, and look and say in her Italian dialect, Giuse, that's the solid, but the va mala la testa, which is Calabrian dialect for Joe, put that book down, it's going to give you a headache. So, so in my house, readings brought on migraines. Um, I listened to my parents in pretty much everything uh, except for that because I, I fell in love with, with books and stories at a young age. And, you know, the name Hemingway, the names Hemingway and Fitzgerald were always these super iconic figures, right? Uh, for anyone who loves books growing up in the United States, it's hard to imagine two writers with a more story reputation than F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway. What do those names evoke? 
I'll just, I'll ask you that. You know, I, I can't see you right now, but I'll just, I'll say, if I say the name Ernest Hemingway, what comes to mind? And if I say the name F. Scott Fitzgerald, what comes to mind? Very different things, right? You know, with Hemingway, we think of this sort of lean, muscular, sinewy prose, you know. Um, we ate well and cheaply and drank well and cheaply and slept well and warmed together and loved each other. That is a classic Hemingway sentence, and that's from A Movable Feast, right? Just this, you know, this, this sort of spare, uh, you know, sparse language subjects and verbs, no adverbs, very few adjectives, and just the kind of, you know, language pared down to its essence. And then we think of um, Fitzgerald. It's the opposite. We think of, you know, that magnificent uh, closing line to The Great Gatsby, uh, which I'll read to you now, you know. So we beat on, boats against the current, the current born back ceaselessly, into the past, so lyrical, you know, so musical. That's F. Scott Fitzgerald. Just, just kind of this effortless beauty and eloquence, right? Uh, there's another passage from The Great Gatsby, which to me sums up F. Scott Fitzgerald's, you know, mastery of prose. He's talking about Tom Buchanan, the, you know, the rather unlikable. Um, and uh, arrogant husband of Daisy, okay? So this is how uh, Fitzgerald writes about him. Tom had not changed since his New Haven years. Whenever they say New Haven in these books, that means Yale, right? Uh, now he was a sturdy, straw-haired man of 30 with a rather hard mouth and a supercilious manner. Two shining, arrogant eyes had established dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes could hide the enormous power of that body. He seemed to fill those glistening boots until he strained the top lacing, and you could see a great pack of muscle shifting when his shoulder moved under his thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage, a cruel body. What a paragraph, right? What an unbelievable mastery and a musicality of language. So Hemingway and Fitzgerald, I see as representing kind of two poles of the American literary experience. On the one, we have the kind of hard, spare, kind of athletic prose of Hemingway. On the other, the more lyrical, the more musical, the more kind of, uh, you know, my students often use the word flowery, right? I, I don't think that's quite the right word for um, Fitzgerald because there's nothing extraneous in what he's writing, but definitely a little more elaborate, a little more highly wrought, right? And the irony, though, of this situation is that for all their differences, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway were actually good friends, were actually two peas in a pod, were actually two writers who helped create one another. We can call them friends, we can call them rivals, we can call them frenemies. All of those words apply. Because when you talk about Fitzgerald and Hemingway, you are talking about the germ, the seed of something that would become probably, arguably, the most important literary friendship in all of 20th century American literature. It's quite extraordinary. It's quite astonishing just how intertwined their fates were. So today for our conversation, I'd like to um, essentially really do three main things and, and, and wrap our talk around those things. First, I'd like to give a sort of a history of that friendship, how they became to be friends, how they came to know each other, how they became part of one another's lives. It wasn't always an easy relationship. It was definitely fraught with tension, but it was a, a significant, very significant for both of them. Uh, two, I want to talk about how they inspired and pushed one another, how the writing of one helped create the writing of others and really magnificent and magical ways. Uh, 
And three, I want to talk about how together they change the history, shape, and contours of American literary history. Let's go back in time. Let's go back. Really, our story begins in World War I. In World War I, Ernest Hemingway serves as a kind of, um, you know, he's essentially a Red Cross driver. He's very, very involved in the battles. He see, you know, he's close to a lot of the fighting. He suffers a tremendous injury uh, that, you know, that keeps him hospitalized for months. It's an experience that marks him in so many of his generation so intently, so much so that Hemingway, like so many, eventually chooses the life of the expatriate. And he moves to Paris in the 1920s, an experience that he wrote about movingly in what I consider one of his greatest books, A Movable Feast, which he wrote towards the end of his life, right before he died. Uh, He died in 1961, and the book was written, most of it, in 1959, but it was published posthumously after Hemingway's death a death by suicide, we should say. Both Hemingway and Fitzgerald had tragic ends to their lives. It's hard to imagine, but Ernest Hemingway, uh, as many male figures in his family did over the generations, uh, I think there were like three and five generations, something like that. Uh, His father committed suicide, as did Hemingway in 1961. Fitzgerald died in 1940 at the age of 44, so he predeceased Hemingway by two decades, and his death was hastened by his crippling bout with alcoholism. So these were really two figures. It's you know, as I said, for all their talent, all their achievement, their soaring achievement, it's hard to imagine how much um, trauma both of them experienced and, and what a bitter end both of them came to. But when he was a young man in the 1920s, it was a different story. Hemingway moves to Paris in the mid-1920s where he decides to become a writer, right? He's, he's At the time, he's like a newspaper reporter. He wants to slowly move out of that and, and become a full-time writer. And Paris is where that happens. And we have to go back and imagine the Paris of this time. I always say if there's any place I could have lived in time, it would be a tough call between maybe Renaissance Florence in the, you know, in the 1480s when Botticelli is painting, when, you know, Michelangelo is is starting to come into his own, or maybe Paris in the 1920s where figures like Hemingway and Fitzgerald are there, as are James Joyce. James Joyce is sort of the king Uh, the unofficial king of of Paris's great writers in the 1920s. His Ulysses comes out in 1922, which is an incredible, you know, you know, a very controversial work, but a critical success. People know it's a work of genius. So Joyce is in their expatriate circle. So is Gertrude Stein, who had these amazing salons where people like Picasso would show up, right? I mean, can you imagine Picasso... Uh, You know, they're all having drinks together, all drinking coffee, all talking about art. What a heady atmosphere. And Hemingway at the time has no reputation to speak of. So in 1925, Fitzgerald is already in Paris. Hemingway is there too, and he gets to meet him. And Fitzgerald is pretty established. His Great Gatsby comes out in 1925, okay? It's not the bestseller that Gatsby hoped it would be. Um, and in fact, he was crushingly disappointed by the, the tepid critical response that The Great Gatsby received. But, you know, he's definitely a major player in the literary scene. He's published by Scribner's, one of the most prestigious presses. Now, if you go to New York City, Scribner's has been, the building has been taken over by the Sephora Cosmetic Company. You know, quite a change, right? But at the time, Scribner's was really one of the most prestigious presses. And, you know, Fitzgerald's A Great Gatsby, this iconic American novel about Jay Gatsby's quest to win Daisy, the love of his life, and his bootlegging and everything that he does to get her. Um, you know, that, that sort of establishes Fitzgerald's rep- rep- uh, reputation. Hemingway has really no reputation to speak of. He's written some traditional short stories. A lot of them take place in Michigan, um, in the sort of hunting and fishing communities there. So he looks up to Fitzgerald with this kind of starry-eyed admiration. 
And to Fitzgerald's credit, he takes Hemingway in and helps him. It's Fitzgerald who sets Hemingway up with his first major publisher, Scribner's. Scribner's publishes The Sun Also Rises in 1926. So let's focus our, our discussion right now on these two extraordinary novels. The Great Gatsby comes out in 1925, and The Sun Also Rises comes out in 1926. The Great Gatsby, I always think of as one of the great American novels. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but it's a term that's been in circulation since the 19th century, and it was coined by a critic called John William DeForest in an essay that he wrote for The Nation in 1868, which is called The Great American Novel. And he, you know, DeForest basically said, can there be a writer who writes a book that provides the picture and now I'm quoting, of the ordinary emotions and manners of American existence. Now think about that. I'm, I'm speaking to you from New York right now, and you're in, in Texas. Think how huge this country is. Think of all the regional differences. Think of all the cultural differences, right? We're all American, right? We all celebrate our common American identity, and yet America is such a plurality, such a melting pot of all these different cultures. How do you distill all that into one book? That was F. Scott Fitzgerald's dream. He wanted to write the great American novel. And if you think about The Great Gatsby, it tells the story of someone whose quest is the American dream, doesn't it? You know, Jay Gatsby, this poor, hard scrabble, working class kid who wants to run with the big, with the big, uh, you know, the big boys and girls of this world, who wants to be as wealthy, who wants to prove to Daisy that he's every bit the man that Tom Buchanan is, you know, that he can, has all the money, all the social class, everything to run with the most elite, prestigious crowd. That's the story of The Great Gatsby, and I think that's why I think of two novels as the great American novel because each of them taps into something paradigmatic about American life. I think of The Great Gatsby because of this quest for the American dream, this idea of uh, making, you know, coming from nothing and becoming something is so ingrained in the American psyche, right? Uh, do you remember that part of The Great Gatsby, if you have read it, where towards the end of the book they find uh, Jay Gatsby's like early diary, and he describes his day. Rise from bed at 6 a.m., dumbbell exercises and wall scaling, 6.15 to 6.30, study electricity, et cetera, 7.15. Isn't that a nod to the, most, um, the, the ultimate self-made American man, Ben Franklin, right, who also studied electricity, who discovered the properties of electricity famously, uh, in Philadelphia when he, he flew his kite in that lightning storm. And Ben Franklin's autobiography actually has a chart of Ben Franklin's day. I, I love showing it to my students. I say, you, we should all follow this chart. Waking up at 5 a.m., addressing powerful goodness, getting to work by 7, you know, uh, asking myself at the end of the day, what good have I done today? And then sleeping for a few hours. Ben Franklin apparently didn't sleep so much. He was too busy doing stuff, right? You know, uh, discovering the properties of electricity, creating the U.S. postal system, I believe, founding the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I mentioned my first teaching job was at the University of Pennsylvania. And when I, I told my mom, I said, you know, mom, I said in Italian, fu fondata da Beniamino Franklin. I founded by Ben Franklin. I said, do you know who Ben Franklin is, mom? And she said to me in Italian, Figlio mio, that's a meal, and also ne meno che cosa ho fatto per colazione stamattina, which translates into basically, my son, please leave me alone. I don't even know what I had for breakfast this morning, let alone who Ben Franklin is, right? <laughs> that, that's how impressed my mom was with me teaching at Ben Franklin's university. Uh, but, you know, Jay Gatsby is this Ben Franklin like figure who comes from nothing. And that is the story of the great Gatsby, right? And it's a tragic story, right? I don't want to give it away, but let's just say it doesn't end well for Jay Gatsby. Um, and spoiler alert, you know, uh, no one basically comes to his funeral. Um, and it's really a tragic story. 
The real tragedy, I think, though, is um, the love affair between him and Daisy, right? What woman could live up to his expectations, right? He had built this figure of absolute perfection, his inspiration, his muse, and he did everything for Daisy. And then they even consummate their love. They have an affair in the book. And of course, she disappoints him because no one could live up to that expectation. And there's a remarkable quote from in the middle of the book where um, the, the narrator, Nick Carraway, talks about that. And I'll read that quote to you. There must have been some moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy tumbled short of Gatsby's dreams, not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. I just love that phrase, the colossal vitality of his illusion. You know, the amazing energy that it took to create this life of pursuing Daisy, this, these riches. And now I'll, I'll continue to quote. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. Gatsby had thrown himself into his pursuit of Daisy with such a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge a man what a man will store up in his ghostly heart. What a line. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man will store up in his ghostly heart. I think that is such a brilliant psychological insight by Fitzgerald. And I think that's one of the things that drew Hemingway to Fitzgerald. This combination of the psychological insights, the facility with language, and the kind of brilliant anatomy of the, the American experience, right? This sort of, this, this ability to dissect and bisect the American dream. When Hemingway read The Great Gatsby in Paris, he was blown away. <laughs> he, he had met Gatsby by then, and they had spent this sort of crazy day together where, uh, you know, they went to pick up a car, um, that Gatsby had left in Lyon, and they took, they, uh, uh, Fitzgerald doesn't show up to the train when he's supposed to. They get to Lyon, they meet there later, and um, Fitzgerald falls ill. They drink themselves silly. I mean, I remember taking notes to the book and writing, how much wine are they going to drink before noon? <laughs> I mean, and at one point, Fitz, uh, Hemingway makes this comment, gosh, Fitzgerald couldn't hold his liquor. We had drank like four bottles of light white wine. And I'm thinking, who can handle four bottles? I don't care how light the wine is. That's a lot of wine, you know? So it, it, it's just this amazing story of excess. And Fitzgerald, uh, Hemingway describes Fitzgerald as a hypochondriac, as completely under the thumb of his wife Zelda, as completely erratic, and is basically as someone who doesn't know how to protect his gift. This is really the big takeaway, that, Gats, uh, that Fitzgerald was given this extraordinary gift, and um, he misused it, you know, because of the alcohol, because of the, 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 the tempestuous marriage, because of his, you know, his inner demons. Fitzgerald had a big problem, a big problem. Setting aside, you know, his marital issues, setting aside his problems with alcohol, he was obsessed with money, and he only wanted to write for money. So when the Great Caspi didn't sell as well as he'd hoped, he kept looking for ways to kind of support the lavish lifestyle that he wanted, and so he eventually actually moves to Hollywood and um, dies basically a broken man there, you know, um, with his alcoholism getting the better of him, et cetera, et cetera, and really just not living up to his potential. He wrote some other fine novels, Tender is the Night, This Side of Paradise, but nothing really ever reached the heights of The Great Gatsby. He was born, I believe, in 1896. The Great Gatsby is published in 1925, so he's barely 30 years old when he writes this book. But, you know, Gatsby was a lot like 
Um, I'm sorry, Fitzgerald was a lot like Gatsby. I always confuse the two because they're so similar. You know, uh, Fitzgerald was of a well-to-do family, a Midwestern family, but, you know, he went to Princeton and saw real money, you know, real elite money, wanted to fit in, never quite does. He never finishes Princeton. He's a terrible student there. There's a pattern that he just can't finish a lot of what he starts. And Hemingway saw that, you know. At the end of his day with, um, with Fitzgerald, he, he writes, if this was the literary life, I wanted nothing to do with it. You know, he said, I wanted to get back to Paris, to my desk, and get back to work. And the amazing thing about Hemingway that people don't realize, because the myth of Hemingway is so large, you know, all the bluster of Hemingway is the boxer, the fighter, the womanizer, the fisherman, detracts us from something really important. He was an incredibly innovative writer and formalist. And one of the things he did was borrow excessively from Fitzgerald. In fact, when he read The Great Gatsby, Hemingway said, you know, whatever his fault, we need to help Scott Fitzgerald because this man has a talent the likes of which very few people in the world will ever have access to. Those aren't his exact words, but that's the gist of his expression, that we need to, to help and nurture this extraordinary God-given ability that S. Scott Fitzgerald has that produced so fine a novel as The Great Gatsby. So what does Hemingway do? Hemingway was a very, very competitive person. He wanted to be top dog. He wanted to be alpha dog among the writers. So he starts to borrow from the people surrounding him. He starts to borrow not just from Fitzgerald, but he also starts to borrow from Gertrude Stein, who's this, uh, she's, uh, Gertrude Stein is this fascinating figure. She's this avant-garde writer. She's in an openly gay relationship with her lover, Alice B. Toklas in Paris in the 1920s, when that was, you know, that, that, that was something that was, was pretty uncommon um, at the time. She is kind of the salon leader. She invites these great intellectuals to her house, the painters, the writers, leading writers of the age, and she's the, the guiding force behind that. She also sort of becomes a mentor to Hemingway. He, he treats her kind of cruelly um, after he takes a lot from her. And he sort of uh, drops her as a friend when once he comes into her house and finds her whispering some lover's talk to her to her, to her um, partner, and he's, he, for some reason he's turned off by that, and, and he says some very unkind things, and Hemingway could be extremely cruel to his friends. Um, you know, he could say um, cutting hurtful things, be very insult, insulting, disrespectful of uh, uh, race, ethnicity, and religion, all these things uh, are things that we know about Hemingway. Um, in terms of Gertrude Stein, he, he realized that she did something with prose that he could benefit from. Gertrude Stein didn't like to edit her work. She liked to do sort of automatic stream of consciousness writing. And so this is an example of one of her sentences. She wrote a book called Paris, France, right? And she wrote a book that this is a line. One has a great deal of pleasure out of dogs because one can spoil them as one cannot spoil one's children. If children are spoiled, one's future is spoiled, but dogs one can spoil without any thought of the future, and that is a great pleasure. You see that kind of rhythmic, you know, accumulation of clauses with and, the kind of tongue-in-cheek playfulness of the sentence. You've heard that somewhere else, haven't you? Yes, and you've heard that in Hemingway, okay? Listen to this Hemingway sentence from Removable Feast. We ate well and cheaply and drank well and cheaply and slept well and warmed together and loved each other. That kind of accumulation of clauses with and is so signature Hemingway. And he's really getting a lot of that from Gertrude Stein. Oh, and the Bible because that's how the Bible, much of the Bible is written. I don't know if you ever read Genesis, but I'll just read you a passage. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. 
God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. You see that and, 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 very, very biblical, very Gertrude Stein, and it becomes very Hemingway. Uh, So that's one of the things he's picking up in Paris in the 1920s. Because when he got to Paris beforehand, he was a pretty traditional short story writer. I mentioned these nature stories. You had none of this sort of avant-garde lilt that would come to define his writing. Who else is he learning from? Well, he's learning from F. Scott Fitzgerald. He's taking some of that lyricism and musicality from Fitzgerald and putting it into his own writing. And for proof of that, I would direct you to one of the most moving passages, not only in all of A Movable Feast, Hemingway's novel of, the 1920, of, of his life in Paris in the 1920s, but one of the most moving sentences in all of Hemingway, period. And it's his homage to his friend, the now deceased F. Scott Fitzgerald, which he wrote in 1959. And I'll read you this. And it's a passage that moves me endlessly. Scott Fitzgerald's talent was as natural as the pattern that was made by the dust on a butterfly's wings. At one time, he understood it no more than the butterfly did, and he did not know when it was brushed or marred. Later, he became conscious of his damaged wings and of their construction, and he learned to think and could not fly anymore because the love of flight was gone, and he could only remember when it had been effortless. What a passage. His talent was as natural as the pattern that was made by the dust on a butterfly's wings. That's what Hemingway said about Fitzgerald. And that is what Hemingway's own style came to mimic in Fitzgerald. To me, that's a Fitzgerald-esque sentence, right? That's so different than your typical lean, mean Hemingway line about eating well and, and, and sleeping well and everything being fine, you know? That's Fitzgerald. That's Hemingway channeling Fitzgerald and putting Fitzgerald into his own prose. And that's how Fitzgerald helped create Hemingway. He gave him that, that lilt, that musicality that Hemingway then made his own. And that's what helped Hemingway write the novel that would change his life, the magnificent The Sun Also Rises from 1926, which is Hemingway's first major book, which is the story of the tragic love affair between Jake Barnes, a man who's impotent because of an injury he received in World War I, and that becomes kind of an allegory for this, you know, for the sense of loss of an entire generation of these young soldiers killed during World War I or maimed and come back to a world that they didn't understand, a world that often, you know, that they had post-traumatic stress disorder in re-entering, right? And his, Jake's love for Lady Brett, you know, the beautiful, promiscuous um, aristocrat, a British aristocrat that um, is, is in love with Jake, but they can't tra- can consummate their love and they go on this sort of, um, you know, this unbelievably hedonistic um, trip to Pamplona for the running of the bulls, where Robert Cohn, um, Jake Barnes's friend, uh, falls in love with Brett, who ends up having an affair with the Matador uh, Romero, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this this book, Hemingway, before he wrote the novel, he would say, I spend a whole morning trying to write a paragraph. How am I going to write a novel? You know, uh, this was a big challenge for him, but it was a novel that was critically acclaimed. And if you've been watching the brilliant PBS documentary, you'll see it's the novel that really sets Hemingway's career in motion. It's when Hemingway, the man, starts to become Hemingway the myth. So his career takes off after that with The Sun Also Rises. And Hemingway goes on to write a lot of great novels. Here's the difference between Hemingway and Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald writes this one transcendently great novel, right? The Great Gatsby. Hemingway doesn't have any one single entrant in the category of great American novel, but he's got multiple really powerful novels, right? The Sun Also Rises. 
for whom the bell tolls, right? Um, A Farewell to Arms, um, one of his most famous books. It's not my particular favorite, but one that many love is The Old Man and the Sea from the 1950s, late Hemingway. Uh, He goes on to win the Nobel Prize and, um, you know, becomes a sort of living legend in his last work, a movable feast. He writes towards the end of his life and publishes afterwards. So Hemingway sort of, and this really sums up the difference between them. Hemingway wrote that one, uh, Fitzgerald wrote that one great book in this fleeting gesture of greatness. Meanwhile, Hemingway, the literary soldier, the one who showed up at his desk every day with his pencil, right? There's a line in, um, in, in, in uh, a movable feast where he writes, uh, he says, you know, you belong to me and Paris belongs to me and I belong to this notebook and this pencil. You know, just this sense of, of him, him being a kind of machine of writing. And, you know, Hemingway never lost his Midwestern roots, even though he ended up in this high society world. In fact, the sun also rises is the tension between the promiscuity and open morals of this this hedonistic culture and Hemming and Jake Barnes, who seems to be judging it all. And to get a sense of, you know, at one point um, in The Sun Also Rises, we, we read, um, someone says to Jake, it is, I believe, um, I'm not sure if it's Jake, but it could speak to all the whole group. It says, you're an expatriate. You've lost touch with the soil. You get precious. Fake European standards have ruined you. You drink yourself to death. You become obsessed with sex. You spend all your time talking, not working. You're an expatriate. You hang around in cafes. As if that's the worst thing in the world someone can do, hanging around in cafes, right? Wouldn't we all love to do that now in this time of lockdown, be able to go to a cafe? Um, It reminds me of this extraordinary letter that Hemingway's mom, who is quite an accomplished opera singer in her own rights, uh, Grace Hall Hemingway, wrote to her son, Ernest, when uh, The Sun Also Rises was published in 1926. It's this amazing letter. The critics, dear, dear Ernest, the critics seem to be full of praise for your style and ability to draw word pictures, but the decent ones always regret that you should use such great gifts in perpetuating the lives and habits of so degraded a strata of humanity. It is a doubtful honor to produce one of the filthiest books of the year. Ouch. Jeez, Mom, you know. (laughs) She goes on, what's the matter? Have you ceased to be interested in nobility, honor, and fineness in life? Such Surely you have other words in your vocabulary than damn. And then she mentions another word that that I I won't mention because it's it's, it's an obscenity, right? And then she ends her her, her, um, letter by saying, Every page fills me with a sick loathing. Wow, imagine getting a letter like that from your mom after you publish one of the most critically acclaimed books, you know, in the, in, in, in the early 20th century, of ones that sort of announcing the herald of a new age of literature. But his, his mom did not like it. And I think that speaks to Hemingway's divided soul, this, this sense of, a figure who on the one hand goes to Europe, you know, imbibes all the great traditions in the European avant-garde uh, and the American avant-garde from, from his friends like F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, Gertrude Stein. And so it's, it's ceaselessly experimental. And yet it's also, also always drawn back to a sense of the American soil, always drawn back to a sense of his roots in Midwestern values. And that's what he shared with Fitzgerald, believe it or not. This, one, of my most, one of my most favorite passages in The, in the Great Gatsby is towards the very end when um, Nick Carraway, the narrator, is sort of looking back. This is after Jay Gatsby's death, after this whole brouhaha about the scandal associated with Gatsby's you know, criminal activities uh, with prohibition and, and, and you know, selling liquor and the, his real fall from grace. This is, this is what um, Nick Carraway says towards the end of the book. One of my most vivid memories is of coming back west from prep school and later from college at Christmas time, right? 
When we pulled out into the winter night from the Chicago train station and the real snow, our snow, began to stretch out beside us and twinkle along the windows and the dim lights of small Wisconsin stations moved by, a sharp wild brace came into the air. That's my Middle West. Not the wheat or the prairies or the lost sweet towns, but the thrilling returning trains of my youth and the street lamps and sleigh bells in the frosty dark and the shadows of holly wreaths thrown by lighted windows on the snow. I am part of that, a little solemn with the feel of these long winters, a little complacent, etc., etc. And I see now that this story of the great Gatsby has been a story of the West after all. Tom and Gatsby, Daisy and Jordan and I were all Westerners, and perhaps we possessed some deficiency in common which made us subtly unadaptable to Eastern life. I think he could add Ernest Hemingway's name to that list. Fitzgerald and Hemingway were the consummate insiders, outsiders, both of the party but not quite of it, both living the life but also observing it from the outside. And I think that's what drew them together ultimately, this sense of in-betweenness, this sense of exile, that they were both sort of, you know, looking at a world as outsiders and trying to make sense of it. For Hemingway, it was about the kind of moral values of this of this, you know, class, people like Lady Brett with her promiscuity and her open relationships with her, you know, her drinking and her hedonism. For Fitzgerald, it was about the, the, the allure of money, old money, right? Like, Jay Gatsby has a mansion in West Egg, but he wants to be in East Egg where all the old money is and he'll never belong. And he looks across the, the sound and he sees the green light from Daisy's dock, and it's like this herald beckoning him to come to her, and he'll never truly arise. After the 1920s, Hemingway and Fitzgerald, after already having changed the history of American literature with their two very distinct writing styles that would be imitated, uh, admired, criticized to this day for generations to come, after having spurred and inspired one another in their works, remained close. It was a fraught relationship um, because Hemingway never stopped thinking that Fitzgerald had betrayed his talent. Hemingway never stopped believing that Fitzgerald, never stopped being haunted by F. Scott Fitzgerald's uh, failure to live up to his potential. And Fitzgerald could feel Hemingway judge him as he strove bitterly and futilely to create the golden writer's life that always eluded him. In 1934, Hemingway wrote a letter to F. Scott Fitzgerald after Fitzgerald's novel, Tender Than As The Night, came out. And he had asked his friend Ernest Hemingway for an honest opinion of his work. The book is about Dick and Nicole Driver, and it's based on Gerald and Sarah Murphy, mutual acquaintances of both Fitzgerald and Hemingway. And this is what he wrote. Dear Scott, I liked your book, and I didn't like it. It started off with that marvelous description of Sarah and Gerald. Then you started fooling with them, making them come from things they didn't come from, changing them into other people. And and you can't do that, Scott. If you take real people and write about them, you cannot give them other parents than they have. You cannot make them do anything they would not do. This was Hemingway's eternal beef with Fitzgerald. Hemingway's own dream in life was, as 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 he said, to write that one true sentence, write that one true sentence. And he believed Hemingway's, Fitzgerald's gift ultimately distracted him from the quest for truth. And he told him he loved Fitzgerald enough to tell him. And as much as it hurt, notice that Fitzgerald wrote to Hemingway for an honest opinion because he knew 
that Hemingway would give it to him. And later in life, he would, as he would say, the two or three people that meant the most to him in his life as a writer, one of them was Ernest Hemingway. We have to think of Hemingway and Fitzgerald for all the rivalry, for all the tension, is ultimately two people who loved each other deeply, two people who had this profound bond, two people that would not become individually the person that they were without the other. Ultimately, I believe that the story of Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald Yes, it's a story about literature. Yes, it's a story about writing. It's about the development of American letters. But it's also the story about a friendship. And it's a story about a friendship that can grow into love based on mutual respect and a mutual understanding that the other person had a gift, the likes of which only comes once or twice in a generation, if ever. And ultimately, that gift, their talent, like their friendship, was one of the greatest that we've ever received in the history of American literature and American culture. Thank you so much for the joy of sharing these reflections, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was very enlightening. And for those of you on the call who have a question, please follow the Q&A prompts that are about to follow. Again, Joseph, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us for this call today with our readers. We really appreciate it. And again, I am extremely enlightened, and um, it's always wonderful to hear about Hemingway and Fitzgerald. I remember reading The Great Gatsby in high school, and I'm sure a lot of people on the call have read The Great Gatsby. I hope so. Um, no spoiler alert. Um, but for those, of you with, <laughs> for those of you with a question on the call, please press star six. We would love to hear your conversation. And we did not have any questions asked in advance, so let's see if we get any questions. How is the weather up in uh, New York? It's an absolutely glorious day today. We've had, um, uh, it's, you know, as that Beatles song goes, a long, cold, lonely winter up here with, with the lockdown and the ice. And um, the last week or so is sort of, um, you know, I know you always have great weather, Kimmy, in Texas. Uh, my, my brother went to um, SMU, so I've, and I've traveled to Dallas a few times for talks. I love the city. It's always a joy to go there. And so Dallas has always been a big part of our family's life. Um, and, you know, we, we here just finally, when you get these nice spring days, it sort of makes up for all the ice and snow that kept you inside uh, in, in those winter months. So th things are finally uh, looking up here. That's amazing. It looks like we have a live question. First question Great. being, I believe it's Rachel. Hi, hi, Rachel. Oh, hi. Hello. Thank you for such a wonderful, wonderful talk. I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on the fact that um, legacies are shaped so much by the lens of what we're feeling in, you know, in our current um, situations, our times, you know, our current generations. When you look back with your perspective on, you know, looking through today's lens, how do you feel like the legacies of Fitzgerald and Hemingway? hold up to today's times, and, and how would you maybe compare and contrast the two? That's a great question. It's actually the fundamental question because, of course, these books were written 100 years ago, right? And one thing I've learned as a professor of literature, no one is guaranteed immortality, not even Shakespeare. You know, we, we keep reading Shakespeare because he still matters to the present. We still read Dante because he matters to the present 700 years after he wrote that's not to say one day he won't, and that's not to say other writers won't replace them. I think Dante and Shakespeare are safe because they're such transcendent geniuses, but, you know, writers like Hemingway and Fitzgerald, their legacy uh, is, is an amazing indicator of just how fickle tastes are. When Fitzgerald's book came out, it, was, it, was, it received lukewarm reviews, 
Okay, it wasn't it wasn't celebrated. Um, it was sort of it was, some people dismissed it. It didn't sell as many books as he'd hoped. That's one of the reasons he went to Hollywood to be a screenwriter. And then, lo and behold, you know, um, maybe it was the, depre- the the depression. Maybe it was the war. We don't know what, but somehow the Great Gatsby slowly entered the American canon and became part of school curricula all over the United States. It's now one of the best-selling books in the country, right? A lot of us read it in college. Uh, I, I don't even, some people may have even read it in high school. You know, a lot, when I give talks, I say, who's read The Great Gatsby? A lot of hands go up. So in a way, The Great Gatsby's um, position is, is guaranteed. But because it's a sign, people don't think of it as a piece of living culture. I, I've noticed that a lot of people after they read it, they're, they're surprised. They say, gosh, yeah, I remember having to read it in college and being so surprised reading it now how much I liked it just as a story. So, you know, that can cut both ways. Being assigned a book in class means somehow it, it can be like steamed broccoli. You know, you have to get it down because it's good for you, right? But you may not love it. Whereas Hemingway kind of had an opposite fate. He was a living legend while he was alive. His book sold like crazy. He won the Nobel Prize. And then after his death, he went through a decline. Part of it had to do with his personality. He represents now a version of masculinity that a lot of people, you know, can find off-putting, um, even toxic. Uh, you know, there's been a lot said and written about his unkind remarks about different ethnicities, um, some of the, you know, uh, religious and, and racial remarks. And, and that's all out there. Um, so Hemingway has sort of, because of it, his personality has definitely suffered. What I think is happening, um, Rachel, is now there's this big new PBS documentary, right? Ken Burns. I think what's happening now is we're having a national reckoning. And what Ken Burns is basically saying, okay, what do we think of Hemingway as a writer, right? We know some of the, the, the negative things about his personality. Uh, we, we know the myth, right? Now, now he's gone. How will the books, how will the writing stand up? And I think what's happening is Hemingway now is being reevaluated vigorously as a writer. And how this all plays out, you know, after the miniseries, after it's now he's in the people are discussing his books again in the papers and the journals and the media, then I'll think we'll see if he'll get a second chance. Because at this point, Hemingway has really started to fade from uh, the American literary landscape. You know, he's, he's definitely not as uh, prevalent as Fitzgerald because of The Great Gatsby. I think because of this, this PBS series, though, a major reevaluation of Hemingway is underway. And we will see, you know, we will see how his work speaks to or fails to speak to younger generations. So it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Um, okay, we have another question in the queue. Um, it should be, I don't know if it's Dennis or Matt, but whoever you are, you are free to talk. Hi, um, I have a question that is more tangential to the main discussion. <clears throat> I really have enjoyed it. I've always enjoyed uh, Fitzgerald's Wild Palms, especially The Old Man. And I wondered if the old man was the source or a major source for Cool Hand Luke. I know it, there was an actual movie called The Old Man based on the novel, but I wondered about the connection with the movie Cool Hand Luke simply because there seems to be a great deal of similarity. You know, I, I, okay, it's a great question. I have to be, I would really have to research that one. Um, because I'm, I'm, I, I, the movie is an extraordinary movie. Um, I, I also teach film, and so I, I, you know, some of the some of these great cinematic works are just as influential as um, the, the the literary works I've discussed. Um, but in terms of an influence from um, from Fitzgerald on the movie, 
I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting, interesting um, question. I guess what I can tell you um, is I can research it, and my, I hope to speak with this group again, and maybe by then um, I'll have an answer for you because this is, this is one that's going to sort of, um, you know, uh, test my skills as a researcher. So I can't answer that offhand, but I definitely will look it up. Uh, so thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, I wondered if you had any other uh, Fitzgerald favorites that stand out besides Gatsby. I think Fitzgerald is a brilliant short story writer. Uh, you know, I, I would highly recommend, as is Hemingway, you know, the, the, they both just were absolute masters of that genre. So I highly recommend, um, you know, uh, checking out both of their short stories. Hemingway's short stories are kind of Hemingway before Hemingway. You know, if you read In Our Time and the Nick Adams stories, it's before he gets sort of um, into the whole European avant-garde, the influence of Gertrude Stein and, uh, and, um, and Fitzgerald himself. Fitzgerald's short stories are just really incredibly imaginative and you know, it's playful, you know, and they're really very, very under the radar, as it were. And he wrote a whole bunch of them, right? Um, I think yeah. there's the, the, a book, The Short Stories of Fitzgerald, which is 43 of them. And, it was, uh, and you can, it, I think it was published as recently as um, 1989 in a, um, in a more you know, a posthumous edition. But I would definitely recommend, I love the short stories. And I think that you get Fitzgerald, a whole range of Fitzgerald um, that, uh, you know, uh, is, is often less discussed. So I would recommend both of their short stories. Thank you very much. Thanks for a great discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. On to the next one. Hi there. You should be live to talk. Hi. I just wondered if you had an opinion about the relationship between each of their um, wives uh, and how that affected, in other words, Zelda's relationship with Hemingway and Fitzgerald's relationship with Hemingway's wives and how that affected the relationship between the two men. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. I mean, the, the big issue there, of course, is um, Hemingway's explicit animosity towards Zelda, okay? Um, Hemingway blamed Zelda for um, Fitzgerald's burdening away his, his skill. She, he blamed, he says a lot of unkind things about Zelda in a movable feast. Uh, there's a, a chapter just to give you a sense of, you know, how much he did not like Zelda. The chapter is it, called um, something about, it's like hawks do not share, you know, basically implying that Zelda was a hawk who wouldn't share her chick, you know, her, 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 her baby hawk with um, Hemingway, right? That, the, that she wanted um, F. Scott all to herself. So, Look, I think ultimately we all have to take responsibility and agency for our own lives. You know, F. Scott was a grown man. He was a, a, a fully-fledged adult. So whatever happened in his marriage with Zelda is between him and Zelda. And I think that it's a sign of the kind of uh, patriarchy of the age and also, you know, to be honest, a lot of the misogyny, um, negative attitude towards women that, you, 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 that, that does crop up right, in, in, in much writing of the age. This was a very macho male culture, especially with Hemingway, and, you know, this sense that somehow um, F. Scott Fitzgerald couldn't defend himself from his wife is a big theme in A Movable Feast. Um, in terms of Hemingway's own marriages, what's extraordinary is he himself writes in A Movable Feast that he was very happy with his first wife, Hadley that they had a kind of um, idyllic relationship that he, um, he betrayed her. He ended up leaving her and their child and marrying, um, he start having an affair and then marrying his second wife. And as you read A Movable Feast, you get this sense of the wistfulness in Hemingway that that decision had 
disastrous consequences for the rest of his personal life, that you get the sense of a person who was never really happy, always restless, and that he did know this perfect bliss at one point in his life with Hadley, and he he destroyed it, you know. So um, it's, it's towards the very end of the movable feast where he's basically been with, you know, his, his lover in Paris um, for a couple of days, and he comes back to the the mountains where he sees his wife, right? And um, he writes, when I saw my wife standing by the tracks as the train came in by the piled logs at the station, I wished I had died before I ever loved anyone but her. She was smiling, the sun on her lovely face, tanned by the snow and sun, beautifully built, her red hair gold in the sun, grown out all winter awkwardly and beautifully. Okay? What a line. I wished I had died before I loved anyone but her. The movable feast is not just about Hemingway becoming a writer. It's about the loss of this love, this defining love that was really, in retrospect, one of the few moments of peace in his otherwise extremely complicated and tormented life. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, We have one final question. I know we've gone over our time, but uh, we have one last question in the queue. Do you have time to answer it? Of course I do. Yes, of course. Awesome. Last question of the day, everyone, and it is with Beth Ann. Hi, Cammie. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? Good, good. Um, um, Professor Lucy, in this time, current era of diversity, how are these books taught? And and how are the students receiving books that were written, as you said, 100 years ago? You know, it's a great question. Uh, it, they, they, they very much perceive them through the filter of their own concerns. You know, it's uh, it, 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 like every generation, right? They, they, they have issues that are on right in their, in front of their face, right? Issues of, and they're, and they're important and vital issues. You know, how do we make a more just and equitable society? How do we address some of the historical issues of racism that have plagued our society? How do we build a better future in in terms of the environment? These are all so vital and so important. And I think that they are, we live in a time of such intense social, you know, uh, concern in preoccupation with these issues that it's very hard for students to just set them aside and, and dive into a book, disconnected from them. So they will bring their concern with issues of how women are treated to the way they read Hemingway, right? They will bring their issues of class concern to how they read Fitzgerald. And that's, that's right. You know, it's, it's, it's important to do that. It's important that we read the books with the concerns of today or else the books just become empty antiquarian pursuits. So on the one hand, I think that's really good. On the other hand, what I would also urge students or any readers to do is, you know, we we need to think about what these writers were doing in their own context, right? How are the values of their time different from our own? How can we sort of make that mental leap to sort of see the world through their eyes? And two, and most important, remember, whatever the person writing it, right, let's let's also look at the, the writing itself. Does the story work as a story? How do we interpret its themes? How do we make sense of its language? In other words, we basically, how do we strike that delicate balance between on the one hand, bringing our own concerns, our own, uh, you know, preoccupations, our own uh, heartfelt um, interests and um, social, you know, investments, from the present to the past, while also B, reading the work in its own context, and then also looking at it as a work of art, right? You know, 
as a, how does it work as a as a piece of writing? What is the style like? What are the themes? What's influencing it? What's the story trying to do? That's the 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 dance. I call it the dance of interpretation. You know what I mean? You, you can't. It, it's like if you're dancing with a partner. You don't want to lead too strong. You want to have the partner. The I also have the same things, but you don't want to be too passive either, right? So it's like. How do you strike that right balance between what your needs are and what the text is trying to do in its own uh, circumstances, finding what's relevant in the text to today while also understanding how the text draws on its own influences in the past? So ultimately, to me, the critics who do it the most effectively are the ones who can strike that balance between the needs of the present and what the work represents in its own time and place. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And uh, just for anybody else listening, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Key West and tour Hemingway's house, it is phenomenal. And it's so much fun to see all the six-toed cats that live there. So just a side. But anyway, thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for that. I'm desperate to travel and desperate to go to Florida. You just gave me something to do. I hope to be able to do that before not too long. Oh, yes. We did it while we were on a cruise, and it was a great side trip. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Anne. And, Joseph, thank you once again for doing this call for our readers. I, I know they appreciate it, as did I. Um, For those on the call, thank you so much for joining in today. We are thankful for each and every one of you. For those of you who called in early and heard our Alexa briefing, we will include information on how to subscribe to receive those on a daily basis after the call. For future DMN download calls and other important information, continue to check out our weekly rewards newsletter on Tuesdays. And Joseph, I cannot thank you again, or thank you enough. Just thank you so much for doing this call again, and thank you for going over the time. I, I really appreciate it. I hope you stay safe and stay well. It was wonderful chatting with you. I'm signing off. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. This has been an absolute joy, and I I hope to do it again. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Kimmy, and everybody. Thank you, Joseph. Have a wonderful afternoon.